Hey everybody, it's Email and Coffee with Joy Brooks. Today I'm talking with Shelly, and Shelly Goldstein is a um, is a very interesting person. She's a public speaker, but uh, extraordinaire. We're not just talking about talking uh, on a stage. We're talking with Shelly. So Shelly, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Hi, Joy, and thank you for inviting me on this really fun show. I will start with the fact that you mentioned I'm a public speaker. I think we all are speakers. We speak publicly because public is more than one person, right? But the idea of being a public speaker is where we fall short. I fell short in that area. And I remember doing a presentation and it was, it felt horrible. I couldn't remember my memorized lines and my slides. And that led me on a journey of how can I get better at this? What is holding me back? That journey brought me into public speaking as a skill that really can be fun and enjoyable. It's true. You know, we take it on some sort of a task, but we do it from, Mm -hmm. from the first moment that we start speaking. Um, and obviously as in a career or even when you're talking with a husband or a wife or your children, um, the skill is required. And knowing that it is a skill, there's a little bit of a talent involved, a little practice perhaps, but it's not about reading index cards, which is what we were taught in school. Mm-hmm. You know, put them on our index card and get in front of the audience and look at your card and, and then be prompted and speak. But if we were instead told, you know, we're going to be talking about this. Tell a story. Mm -hmm. Go. Mm -hmm. Um, There would be no cards. We would be Mm -hmm. relating the story to the small group, to the one person, to whatever it is. We do it all the time when we talk with people one-on-one, we're telling stories. But when we get into a career and we're doing presentations for whatever reason, it's just like tell the facts, get you know, do the slide deck, point to the screen. Um, it, it and everybody walks out and goes, "What did she say? <laughs> <laughs> what was that all about?" And you know, there are better ways of doing it. I think that's where you're coming from. You know, Joy, you said some really amazing things. Um, it is true. This is what we talk speaking publicly to our, to, and personally and professionally, it's all the same. And we do it all the time. Public speaking coaches aren't teaching you how to speak. We, we, we know how to do that, but as storytelling creatures, which humans are and have been from day one, you're right. Where did the line cross where we got into a business mode and storytelling doesn't account for anything. All of a sudden, we're supposed to just deliver facts. Well, Brene Brown famously says, you know, you can tell a story about the facts because it adds soul mm. to the data. Mm-hmm. And it's so true because every statistic you look at, every algorithm that's being checked on your phone in your social feed, there's a story as to the human being who's creating that that interaction, that story, that journey helps frame the data. The data supports the story and people listen to stories. It's hard for us to listen to facts. So you're a hundred percent right there. Now having cards, as long as they're bullet points and basic concepts, it's okay to have a few nudges and a few reminders like slides should be a supporting representation of what you're talking about. But the truth is your experience and your stories, you know, you know your work. So you could talk about it at length, at great length. You Mm -hmm. shouldn't need business cards for that. When somebody asks you about an, (laughs) what happened to you last Friday, that great story driving cross country. Do you really need cue cards for that? You do not. Makes sense. Uh, You know, I've often, 
I've ha I've had a few presentations and in building the presentation, you know, I'm like, okay, they're probably going to want to slide deck. So let's just put something together. So the first page is always, you know, all the data and the data is boring and everybody looks at it and goes, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to now extract some story from the data. And, you know, marketers, at least that's how I look at my metrics. It tells a story. I got to see the story, what, whatever the story is. Brilliant. And then I try to use visuals from that. So I don't want to say, well, 15% then point, 15% said, I don't want to do that because I still don't think they register. There are some people that are going to walk away and say, well, 15%, blah, blah, blah. And they're going to remember those numbers, but it's not meaningful. What I try to do is provide a visual a graph that sh that tells a story. If the numbers are going like that, mm -hmm. or the numbers are going like that, or if they're going like this, there's a story there. Right. People will see that, right? But it, there's a story and you don't necessarily need to say, here is 15%, here is 50%. You don't need to do that. You could basically, you know, go through the story behind the data. And in many cases, the best presenters, the best um, business meetings, networking meetings, key speakers, whatever it is, all of those, they're telling stories about the data. And they, you don't even realize they're talking about data. That's true. That's true. I mean, there, and I just, I just uh, coached uh, a a uh, representative or they call them uh, partnerships uh, in, in a tech company that their responsibility was to give the data to the client, that the client, that's all they wanted to know. We want to see the facts and the numbers. And, you know, there are instances where you can present that you can present an overview of the data to, because to, you want to give people what they want to come to listen to. You can interweave those stories to support it and make it interesting and open the conversation. And you can also offer them more data. I have more in-depth studies. I'm happy to share it with you after this. Right. Can I answer any questions? So as long as you open up that discussion and the client was happy, but you're right that the first slide wasn't so dense that it took away from anything, but there was enough that the client felt they got what they requested, which is important. I mean, listening is a huge component to speaking, believe it or not. Yeah. Well, that's something that I do want to, you know, do want to mention It's it's like when you're up there and you're the speaker, you're speaking, but you're listening too. Big time, because you can prepare for the audience you expect. But you never get the audience expect, you expect. You have to listen to the audience that's before you. And the truth is, that's why we talk about prepare only to a degree, because if somebody asks a particular question, or if you notice that when you're talking to people, they're not grasping what you're saying, having that listening skill might switch the whole conversation. So we prepare you to let go of that agenda because that nugget, that bit of information, that path may be a far more interesting path and engaging because now you've unearthed something that in all your research you didn't find, but that person just revealed it. Right. And if we allow ourselves to experience that, that's where creativity and innovation come into play. So preparing is, you know, proceed with caution on that. Just be prepared to let go. But what you said is, is, is good because I think that's the biggest fear is that, you know, I'm coming and I know what I'm going to say and mm. someone's going to ask a question and I won't know what to, what to say. But mm. the point is that's, that's the, that's the public speaker that excels the one even one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I, I've often said, uh, you know, I, I wish I had joined the debate club because <laughs> times I'll be ha having a conversation with somebody and they catch me off my guard and I, and I'm like, uh, okay. And I don't know what to say. And I walk away five days later. Oh, I should have said this. And I yes. want to start it all up again. But if you're yes. on stage or if you're presenting, or if you're having one of these conversations, if you're, train yourself 
to listen. But also, I don't know what it is. Is it fear? Is it intention? You know, are you off track? How do you shift? How do you learn to shift? Wow. It, you know, every single client that comes through the workshops has this experience. You know, somebody, you're in an interview and they ask you a question, especially ones like, you know, what, what was your failure? Well, nobody wants to talk about that. So there's all types of opportunities where somebody catches you off guard. We, Mark and I, my coaching partner, Mark, Bar Mark Bossert, we coach people on breath. Mm. We have this innate sense that we need to answer right away and talk and give a lot of information and pile up all the facts and data. And the truth is just like the slides, people can't hear all of that. Mm. And we tend to feel like we ramble. There is nowhere written that you cannot take that breath. When somebody asks you a question, create that space, take that breath because it does a few things. And maybe the listeners are experiencing this now. It allows me as the speaker to connect with what I want to say. And it provides the speaker with an opportunity to not only catch up with what I'm trying to say, but also it shows that I'm being thoughtful mm. in what I want to say. I'm not just spewing and saying just for the sake of getting the BS out. Mm -hmm. I'm really taking my time, which is an engaging, it's, it's engaging for speakers, but it also helps us connect. And say, this person's giving me some real truth here. And also, not only with the breath, in addition, there's nothing wrong with saying, that's a really good question. I don't know that I have the answer right now. I have to think about that. People would prefer that you give them accurate information and come back to them with factual data or what have you. Then again, just say anything to say anything. This is our credibility at stake. And people will respect it. We we think internally that, oh my God, I have to da, da 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 You do not. It's not written anywhere. It's not expected. People want the truth. That's why, and they want to find out more about you. That's why they're asking you these questions. It's not to fool you or set you up. And when we realize that, we can answer in a way that we feel good about. Right. It it's it's almost like you know the extrovert would say is there a toolkit like what am i doing here because the the i i'm sorry the introvert because the extrovert um gosh the extrovert has it's almost it's it's inherent the extrovert god bless him i am not an extrovert everything i do it's literally like jumping off a cliff mm. Internally, I could do anything, but externally, I have to push every single time. And I do push and I'm here, right? Yeah. So um, <laughs> so for the introvert who admits to themselves, I'm an introvert and this is just not for me, but you can't, you, you cannot do that. Is there a toolbox? I mean, what do they, what does the, how does the introvert begin to practice they want to, they want a muscle, but they, you know, what do they start doing? Well, it's interesting because there's a lot of discussions about extroverts and introverts. And I, I believe there's a little bit of ambivert in all of us. Mm. We, we, we waver between the two. Most people come to us that have a fear of public speaking. They don't feel they have anything of value to say. They're afraid someone's going to judge them. A lot of this is inner dialogue. A lot of labeling yourself as I'm an introvert, I'm an extrovert, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm too short, I'm too tall, whatever it is, this is an inner dialogue that we label ourselves. And take note that it's an inner dialogue. No one's, no one's saying it to our faces. It's what we believe. And it is not true. Most of the time, it is not true. When you're speaking to an audience, like we're speaking to an audience today, how do we know what they're thinking? Mm -hmm. Somebody might be washing dishes. Somebody might be texting. Somebody might be listening intently thinking, oh yeah, that's me. But we have no way of knowing how anybody is thinking unless we open the dialogue and have the conversation. So why not change our inner dialogue? Why not 
reduce those judgments and experience what might happen if we just let that go? What would happen if we didn't have that thought Mm -hmm. that I'm an introvert? What if we didn't have a label? And that takes us to the toolbox of gamification. Using improv as an underlying theme in the games. If we think about playing games as children, being in that beginner's like mindset, we there's not a lot of judgment. Children just run out onto the playground and jump onto swings, typically run into the sandbox, make friends, There's very little judgment. Judgment is learned as we experience things. So what if we got played a few games and got back to that mindset? What would happen if we just let it go? Mm -hmm. Like, will anybody, you know, will anybody get injured because they they, they let themselves speak their truth and how they felt? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Usually we're still standing. Usually, usually, yeah. You know, it's almost like uh, marketers do A-B tests. Well, you know, you're an introvert. Do an A-B test. You know, say, come out of your shell a little bit. Do something that you don't normally do. Do the B test (laughs) and see what happens. And you'll realize, okay, maybe you made a mistake. Maybe, you know, you spoke and you didn't know what to say. You didn't say it right. You rushed it a little bit. Whatever, Whatever it is, I do it all the time. If you realize it, and say, okay, guess what? Volcanoes didn't erupt. Sky didn't fall. I rushed it. <laughs> I'll try and not rush it the next time. Well, to your point, A-B test is exactly what we're doing here. There's going to be a different reaction to no matter what we say. We have to instill the belief in ourselves that we're doing our best. And yes, I could have said it differently. I could have done it differently. Let's try that the next time. We build that awareness muscle to say every opportunity is a good opportunity. Let's see how we can improve on it. There is no perfect speech. As a matter of fact, any speech that might sound breathtakingly perfect is tremendous amounts of improvisation and free flow, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Because again, in that subconscious part of our brain is where the creativity, the innovation happens. And when you're creative and innovative, you're feeling confident. So there's a confidence piece to that. Mm -hmm. But when we stifle those pathways, it's really hard to experience confidence when you're not experiencing creativity and openness. Right. They work hand in hand. It's, um, um, it's not so much of where you've been because some people will say, well, you know, I, I'm a waitress. I, I don't need to do this, but you do. So, you know, I, you know, uh, I'm a cashier or, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have a career. I'm a mom, you know, or, or the career that I have is my, is being a mother. That's what my plans are, you know, or I do plan on be going into politics and therefore I'm going to be speaking and impressing groups of people and persuading people. So all different levels. The point is that, any everywhere in our life, everywhere in our life, um, the ability to speak what we feel is really very important, and 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 holding that back because we feel that no one cares, holding that back because oh, I don't know how to say it, holding it back because I'm afraid to say it. Um, it's not, it's, it's not going to get us any satisfaction. We, I mean, we all don't need to be um, TED Talk people. We don't, that's not where, what we're talking about here. What that's we're talking right. about is, uh, right. is the right. communication. To express ourselves. Yes, and, it's, yes. And becoming confident in that to the extent that we want it to go. Maybe we will, you know, maybe we'll start off as cashiers and become TED speakers and maybe even politicians. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, learning how to speak and listening to others speak, um, and, um, exercising that tool, it's just like riding a bicycle, fall off, you get back right back on. 
you know, you just keep going. You're not saying, oh, I'm afraid of the bicycle. Right. And, you know, it's going to get you from here to there. I want to, I want to go back to the cashier. Yes. A hundred percent. Right. The truth is here's something really interesting. People that are on the front lines, uh, customer service people, uh, people that are cashiers, as you said, they, they are the, 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 the one-on-one in touch with the, the the one-on-one contact point to the the customer. And almost the most important one-on-one. Exactly. And every, every business should, should realize this. That is their state. That that is where the customer comes back for more. They learn about the experience. So these customer service frontline people have brilliant, a lot of them are amazing and having brilliant conversations. How are you making a comment about maybe something they're scanning? Oh, I didn't know we had this. What do you do? How do you make the eggplant? What, what is your favorite way to do this? Or there's, all kinds of scenarios. And I can tell you one, um, I was coaching a hedge fund team and they would tell me how their process, how they would move. They were, they were managing millions and millions of dollars for clients. So these very affluent people would come into their, their office and they would say, Oh, you know, the girl at the desk, it was always a girl at the desk would give them water drinks. This is their experience, right. Or offer them tea and coffee and they'd have a conversation and they would, you know, we would let them sit in the lobby because they would have these great conversations. And then we would bring them into the conference room and we would, you know, make sure they had their coffee and tea. And then we would start our, you know, one hour presentation. And it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who would I give my billions of dollars to if I had that? The weren't in the front office who asked me about how I was and what I was doing and sharing information and, or somebody who offered me coffee and tea and then threw me into, you know, an hour worth of PowerPoint slides. We don't realize that that frontline person is making a connection. Yes. They're doing it brilliantly. And that's where the trust comes in. That's where the relationship builds. And those skills, believe it or not, are the most important skills for building business. It's not just sales. It's not sales. Because that's, I mean, obviously... It's a different flavor, but it's not just sales because the salesman needs to be a storyteller as well, but it is that trust element and that um, it's, it really is authentic. I mean, uh, lack of any better term here, you know, here you're, um, you're on a line with three other people. You finally get up. It's your turn to, you know, get your vegetables scanned. And so, all right. but you're having this great conversation with the woman. And the next time you come to the store, guess which line you're going to go into. That's true. You have your favorite people. You have your favorite people that are helpful. And, and you're, you're going to go back to that store because of that person. That's right. Or restaurant or any kind of business. Any kind of business anything. It, it, it's this, this engagement we're talking about, whether you're the hedge fund manager or you're at a grocery store that trumps any marketing flyer or sales pitch or advertisement you could put out there. Anything. And it is the fact that it's authentic. Again, that word that, you know, it, it's a buzzword, but the truth of the matter is when you're talking with somebody, you know, immediately, um, do they give a shit Yeah. or not? Uh, you know, is the salesman just asking me these questions because he's got, you know, that this is the way he was trained or is he asking me a set of questions because he's actually interested in, who, in what I am? Because in the end, that's how he's going to sell me. He's, he's actually tuning in. Oh, I, she's going to she's going to want a black car. So let's not even go to gray or blue or anything else. The way she's talking, she's going to want that black car. And the, and the, and the, the, you know, the, the car salesman is going to show me exactly what I want because he's in tune and he's also authentic because he's talking with me and he's getting information. I can tell he's tuning into what I want and I know I'm going to get what I want. And the truth is when it comes time to buy a car again, I'm going to go back to the dealership and I'm going to say, is, is Tom still here? Yeah. Yeah. It's that. I want to talk to Tom. Cause that, and, and in speaking, whether you're having these conversations or you're making a presentation or you're engaging in a board of directors meeting, just making sure 
what you're saying matters to you is really where it starts. If you care about something, chances are the people you're speaking with will care too. We can't control that. Some people may not be interested, but we're there to care about what we're saying and feeling. That's the authentic piece you talked about. And we're there to align with the people that go, yeah, I get that. Again, not everybody's going to agree. We can't control that. You're not always not going to be nervous. I mean, I still get nervous when I do speaking engagements, but the truth is how can I re repurpose my energy so it's more effective and useful to what I'm doing? Is it nerves and, ex and or is it excitement? Is it hysteria or is it effective energy? And we can learn that skill of how to manage it, how to take it in different areas so it serves us. So when we're speaking, people know I'm a little nervous today I'm because I'm a little excited. I'm a lot excited. Let's have this talk. And usually just even saying that out loud mm -hmm. changes everything, changes your state of being. And people respond to it like, hey, who who's not nervous when they speak? Who doesn't forget to turn on their 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 mute when they're speaking on Zoom? I mean, these things happen all day long. When we start admitting this truth, we realize more more of us are like each other than we're yes. not alike. Exactly. The yeah. area. Find the commonalities. It, it's not so much, oh, this person's so much better than I am, but it's more like I can really, really relate to this person, even yeah. though they may be so much better than you. That's right. That's um, right. That's and, right. But how do you, you, you mentioned something about, you know, the shaky voice, how, you know, you get up and you start and you're real, oh my gosh, well, how do you, how do you work yourself out of that? Because you can't go, all right, I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you, 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 you can get back to that breath. The breath is the most valuable tool we have in, in a lot of what we do. First of all, it's a life force, but it connects the mind to the body. And it also, these long, slow, deep breaths help us relax our nervous system. If our voice is shaky, who's to say we can't stop, take a breath, say, you know, let me try that again. No one's going to beat you up for it. It happens all the time. Yeah. And one thing I noticed that you were doing is that you were um, breaking up your words. So you could mm -hmm. slow down a little bit. So instead of sounding like this, you can sound like this. Because I'm feeling it. When I take the breath, my physical body changes. That's why in, you know, when you, you see a lot of parents with their little children and the kids like, <laughs> like hyperventilating because they're really upset and they're really scared. And the parents like, all right, or the individuals breath, that take a breath, just slow down. And when that child starts to slow down with the breath, hopefully they calm down a little bit. And we're the same way. We're that same child. Yeah, it doesn't change. And then we connect with when we have that space. It's like, how do I feel about what I'm speaking about? And that changes also the conversation. It's less in my head of what am I thinking about? What do I need to say? But rather, how do I feel about this? You know that answer. And mm -hmm. you could speak to that. Mm -hmm. I, I, playing games, I guess, brings you through. Um, well, it makes it fun because, oh, let's play a game. And you're like, okay. Uh, right. But it sort of brings you through. It's sort of uh, like it's a competition, but it's not. You don't say let's compete right now, because if you said well, let's compete now, you, I want you to be better than you were before. Everybody would be like, oh, I, I, I don't want to do that. But if you let's play a game. OK, <laughs> well, the stakes are low. The stakes are low. So if you have a huge interview that you really want to work for this company, really with all every fabric of your being, you're going to be nervous. But when we're playing games, we, we get in a calm state where there, there's no, the stakes are low. We can mess up. We can lose. We can win. We can, can laugh. experiment and explore. And once we 
get into that state of being, we can practice, 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 and we start learning that skill and developing that skill through this low stakes environment, this safe environment. And there's, it's a building block. Okay. What can we add next time? What did we do well here? Let's keep building on it. And then when we get into a high stakes situation, our skills are a little more sharpened, yeah. but it's almost like the artist. You could take Pablo Picasso, any famous artist, any, mm -hmm. any creator, any scientist is our work ever done. Is the painting ever finished? Is the science, does the science ever end? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. It's a continual process. What we have to do is believe in ourselves that this is good at the moment. This is enough. Mm -hmm. And next time I'll explore and discover something else and I'll take it further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's not an extraneous skill. It's not like, oh, when, when am I ever going to use this? Like, right. Like, like no one ever said ever. It's something you literally do as you get up in the morning. Well, you know, or you come home, honey, how was your day? Right. <laughs> right. Or you wake up in the morning and you're thinking internally, oh, these are the things I've got to do. And, you know, it's almost like holding, you, you sort of hold yourself back from being, um, Debbie Downer and the bummer of the day where you wake up on Monday. Oh my God, it's Monday. You start beginning to think on a different level where, oh, it's so exciting. Now, yeah, I mean, you could, you could, you, you could have a bad day, but what we, what happens in having these conversations, even at home, first thing in the morning is, are we, are we sharing ideas and listening just listening sometimes to somebody's plight or where they're at, or are we trying to convince somebody of our agenda? And that's where communications break down because sharing of an idea or sharing or learning something new is really how we grow and engage. Oh, I didn't know that, or I didn't know that. But if we're only forcibly trying to push our point forward and convince, you can't convince anybody that doesn't want to be convinced. Yeah, you can't motivate people. You can inspire them. You can't motivate them. So you let's share that idea. Let me hear your challenges. That's mm -hmm. interesting. You know, I learned that about myself in this discussion. And that's how we build better communication skills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very true. It's um, it, part of, you know, part of my journey has been to listen to the little person in the back of my head, I call my uh, demon, um, not to be confused with devils, <laughs> but in any case, the classic demon. Yeah. And um, I often, you know, turn my head and say, what in the world are you talking about, woman? I don't even know, but I, <laughs> I am prodded only by taking the next step. So I take little steps i don't do anything that scares the bejesus out of me um but i build i keep building and i often find my environment by finding my boundaries so i know okay he, you know i'm really comfortable here am i comfortable taking the next step out and i'll i'll measure it and i'll say not in my lifetime will I ever take a step out. Okay, why? I understand. And I, you know, I, I, that's how I've lived my life, which is why I know I won't be jumping out of an airplane, but there are some things that I will take to the next limit. And part of the podcast has been, let's meet people that I've never talked to in my entire life and have a meaningful conversation. Why? Because it makes me uncomfortable. Oh, I love it. Why that. would you want to do that? Because I'm, I'm going to take it to the next level. I'm going to learn from it. Mm. I'm, and I'm actually engaging with someone else, which is fruit beyond fruit. Are you enjoying it, Joy? I'm, is there joy? There is, <laughs> joy? There, is, um, there is fear with every time I hit the record button, every time yeah. I hit it, there's ultimate fear. And at the end, I'm thinking to myself, this was the best one yet. Ever. Oh my gosh. Thank you see, speaking can be, when we lean into our fears, like public speaking, 
And we lean into that anxiety, that worry, it actually could be fun if we take that deep breath and it's that whole preamble. So what happens if we don't have that preamble? What happens if we reframe that and we lean into what's uncomfortable? Like you said, you're you're still going to be here. You're still here doing the next interview and it keeps working. So that's kind of the framing or the reframing sometimes of certain beliefs because it is fun. And that's why the games are fun. We re- people realize speaking when, when they six are self-expressed and they share their feelings and somebody else is listening and you're listening to them. It's actually joyful. I, I mean, really, is there anything else in life but that, I, you know, no man is an Island. No woman. So why, why, why all the, why waste the energy and build up the stress and trauma in our systems to get to that point. And when you realize it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be that way. So, you know, do, um, we're going along on the journey and some of us do need instruction. Some of us perform better when it's organized, when it's structured and others, um, will, you know, they're the DIYs, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But if somebody wanted to connect with you to, you know, to to basically um, train with you, how how would they connect with you? How would they get to you? What are you doing now? Share with my listeners so that they may, they, uh, they may uh, engage with you. That's wonderful. The journey it's all a journey, right? Yeah. And we all are taking that road, including myself. I could be found on LinkedIn at Shelly Goldstein at LinkedIn. And my company is Remarkable Speaking. And we have a website and you can Google that. And that's the best way to find uh, myself and Mark Bossert, my coaching partner. We do a lot of guest appearances like this on podcasts. We're hosting a lot of workshops for different organizations. And we post a lot of videos and share ideas about speaking. And so the best thing to do is to kind of follow us and see see what you think about some of these videos and points that we're discussing and sharing. And if it seems like it's a good fit, reach out by email and we can go from there. Yeah. We'll have the conversation. I, you know, I, I strongly recommend networking with people it's it's really the only way that you will open yourself up because mm-hmm. what you say oh no oh no oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah you know you don't really know you've got to keep it open and the only way to keep things open is to keep talking with people especially the people that you wouldn't think you're talking to so you know open that discussion with the customer service rep you know, I, I honestly, I, I, I'm on the phone with GoDaddy. I'm trying to get support and I'm leaning into this person. If I'm nasty to the person and that if I treat them like they're an idiot, odds are I'm not going to get the best support I need. So why would you do that? Why would you belittle any situation, belittle yourself, belittle the, ter- the person you're talking with? Why not make it the best, everything the best? So challenge ourselves a little bit, go to that, go to that grocery store in your neighborhood and strike a conversation with the produce person or the person who's checking you out at the cash register. Talk to the person online behind you or in front of you, or, or raise your hand at a webinar when you have absolutely nothing to say. What's the worst thing that can happen? Maybe you just say, you know what, that was a great topic you talked about today, Joy. I loved you talking about toolboxes and ways I can learn public speaking. Thank you for that. Exactly. That's all it has to be. So reach out and push because when we get out of our comfort zone, that's where the real growth is. That's where the real growth is. And that's it, man. That's it. It's almost like mic drop. (laughs) Get out of the comfort zone a little bit. And that's where the growth starts. Because if you just, you know, if you just eat your Cheerios every morning and, and you know, and, and your grilled cheese every night and watch the same TV show before you go to bed, that's who you're going to be in 20 years. 
Well, that's okay too. That's okay like, too. How can we add a little spice? Maybe we'll put bacon on the grilled cheese. Maybe we'll put a little chili powder. You know, how can we spice it up? And you, you talked about networking. So when you're working with Mark and I on our on our program, we we work with you on having that unique, bringing out your uniqueness, your 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 own personal self expressed message as an introduction. Notice when I was talking about, when you asked me to introduce myself, I talked about my journey less about, oh, I'm Shelly from Remarkable Speaking. Here's my phone number and here's where you can reach me, which is on my website, which is probably what everybody else is going around the room doing. How can we tell a little story to show our unique qualities and engage with people to say, you know what, what you talked about today was interesting. I want to learn more. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's have that conversation like the front desk person mm -hmm. who asks you how you're doing, how this is, how that is, and doesn't throw a pitch at you. That's a great that's, way to connect with people. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what we coach on. Well, it's been a pleasure. Yes, it has been joy. Thank you so much for opening yeah. your heart today <laughs> and your comfort zone. Yeah, really. Now I'm going to go jump out of an airplane. <laughs> Well, everybody, take care. It's been a lovely uh, another episode of Email and Coffee with Joy Brooks and Shelly Goldstein. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.